Hello, everybody, and hello, PCR Online. I am Mirvat al Asmaj. I am an interventional cardiologist at King Fahad Armed Forces Hospital in Saudi Arabia. With me today is the first author of the Valvular Heart Disease Guidelines that were just elaborated and presented at the European Society of Cardiology, Professor Alec uh, Vahanyan. He is a professor of cardiology at the University de Paris. He's also the co chair of the current ESC EACTS guidelines. He was the chair of the 2007 and 2012 guidelines on the very topic and was a member of the task force in 2017. So thank you, Professor, for taking the time to be with us today. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. It's always a pleasure. Well, um, you know, I, uh, the guidelines were very impressive. There are some significant updates from uh, the previous guidelines. And so what I'm going to do is uh, quickly go over a few questions and highlights uh, that our audience would be interested in learning about. So, uh, you know, the first one is, of course, aortic stenosis. Um, it is a, a, an important part of the valvular guidelines. And they see there have been a lot of discussions on early intervention for patients with severe uh, aortic stenosis, such as the recovery trial for surgical AVR and an ongoing trial that's still not published, the early TAVI trial. So uh, how is, uh, are these trials incorporated in the current guidelines and what does it recommend in terms of early intervention? Okay, so thanks for the question. Uh, generally speaking, one of the new aspects of these guidelines is to promote earlier intervention in asymptomatic patients at low risk for surgery because it's uh, the vast majority are operated when something is done. And this applies to aortic stenosis. What is uh, new in this respect, in these guidelines, is that following longitudinal studies, more than randomized, longitudinal studies, we saw that the threshold proposed for intervention might be too late. The first thing we changed is to propose intervention if the ejection fraction is below 55 and not below 50 only in asymptomatic patients. That was shown by French authors and others. Also, in patients who are fully asymptomatic with normal stress test, normal ejection fraction, we did propose um, to consider it is written surgery should be considered in patients who have very severe aortic stenosis. And here the threshold for very severe uh, did uh, change slightly. In 17, it was 5.5 meters per second. Now it is 5. One of the elements which pushed us into this direction is the trial you called the recovery trial. It's one element. But I think we should be quite cautious here because uh, it might well be that uh, four of the patients in the medical treatment arm was not extremely close, in particular, did not incorporate regular stress testing. This is shown by the fact that many patients were operated on while in heart failure, which means that they were probably not very closely followed. Because when you do not operate a patient with severe aortic stenosis, you should follow him very carefully on a very regular basis. Other, other factors which may invite you to do something is an elevated BNP, for example, that's, uh, that, that's very, very important. So this is uh, the point earlier, of course, we are waiting for early TAVI, but it's, uh, it's at a distance and we'll have to wait a little bit. On this respect, I think today, we should not exclude TAVI for patients who claim to be asymptomatic. Because if a patient claims to be asymptomatic and if exercise tests show that, in fact, he is symptomatic, he should go through the decision tree as the other, because he's not a symptomatic. Yeah? That's the point. Yeah, and so that takes me to the next question of stress testing, which you actually already started to discuss. Um, who are the patients then that you would offer uh, stress testing for, and 
And what is the landscape like globally for using stress tests for aortic stenosis? Okay, the landscape is, uh, we are disappointed. You know, <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm a bit pessimistic, I'm sorry about that. No, the point is when we run with, hello? Ah, when we run with my friend, Professor Jung and all the colleagues, the first UART survey at the end of the millennium, at the very beginning of the millennium, we were disappointed to see that many asymptomatic patients do not undergo stress testing. And things are not really improved more than 10 years after, because the last publication was done in, 19, oh, uh, in 2019. And in Europe, stress testing was very seldom used in patients with severe aortic stenosis who claim to be asymptomatic. So the plea is do stress testing. In this patient, if you are in a secure environment, it'll be extremely helpful. Yeah, it's interesting. I was speaking to uh, Professor Otto as well, uh, and she was saying the same thing about stress testing, that it's not, it's underutilized and perhaps out of fear that initially people thought it was a contraindication to stress test patients with AS. So um, hoping you know, that changes. <laughs> Yeah, what I mean is you have to do it in a secure environment. You should not, when you're in your office, uh, write a prescription, go uh, undergo the stress testing uh, in a gymnasium, I don't know where. No, it should be done by a cardiologist with some training. And the advice is if there is, a, you know, some. Uh, a couple of weeks or months between your prescription and the stress testing, the person in charge should really speak with the patient before. That's very important because the asymptomatic might well be asymptomatic at the time the stress is uh, planned. Yeah? Okay, so cautious here. Absolutely, thank you for clarifying that. And, and so another point is the issue of age. Now the European guidelines used an age of 75, the American guidelines used an age of 65. How, how do the current European guidelines um, you know, address both age and risk and frailty um, um, in the decision-making? Okay, so uh, thank you for this question, which is very important to me. Well, if you read, uh, carefully the table of recommendation, this was not the first. The first recommendation is that the decision about the mode of intervention in patients with aortic stenosis should be taken by a heart team. First, working in a Harvard Center, that, that's very important. It means people with experience in this disease. That's the first point. Second point, the heart team should take into account clinical factors. Clinical factors, it means cardiac, symptomatic, not symptomatic, because if the patient is symptomatic, is it due to the aortic stenosis? Not sure, not sure at all. We should know that. Clinical, we should look at the comorbidity because we are still in a, you know, a relatively elderly population. No, what is old? You know what is old? What is the definition of old person? Uh, Shabuddin Rahim Tula, you probably heard about him, he used to say, I love this guy, he used to say, what is old? It's older than me. And you'll see when you'll be my age, it's very important to remember. No, but I mean, uh, you, you should look at this, uh, the risk. And the risk, the surgical risk is part of the game. It's only part of the game. And now it was very helpful to have the surgical risk, STS, the root core, to design the study. But now we should go far beyond. We should take into account, but also look at other factors. And since 2017, it's written in the ESC guideline, you should take into account anatomical factors, local factors, for example, a huge calcification below the valve for heavy uh, calcification of the aorta for um, surgery, uh, breast radiation for uh, surgery, etc. All these factors should be cautiously taken into account. Thus, you take this triple, and then you end up with a proposal to your patient, and then the decision is taken, taking into account the informed 
patient choice. This is the global state. And uh, it's the same in the US guide. If you read the US guideline carefully, it's written in the text. They are grossly the same tables. We have the same reason. Now, uh, if you want to enter into age, once again, I repeat, age alone doesn't make the full picture. Okay, that's very important. Why did we put age at that time? Because many people use it. It's relatively practical. But what is age? Age is a sort of a surrogate for life expectancy. And, you know, I'm, I'm not bright enough because I cannot find uh, the information I want from uh, statistics which are available about uh, the life expectancy of the patient. Even looking very carefully at the global burden, even asking to specialists, it's a uh, very difficult. It's almost impossible for a stupid cardiologist we are to draw a precise, no, a precise prediction of the life expectancy of the patient who is in front of you at the, the given time. Also, these tables are made for general population, not for the very high risk population we are discussing here. So we use this surrogate of age. And then in the US guidelines, the reasoning, if I understand, is taken, well, we choose mechanical valve or biological valve, and then we, we start to, uh, to dichotomize. But, well, I explained to you, we, we have a different approach. Should we intervene or not? If the patient is uh, ready to die, no, we won't intervene. If he has a cancer, we won't intervene, of course. If he's ready for intervention, then we dispute the mode of intervention. So the bioprocess is mechanical, it's not the issue. In point of fact, we agree, it's always uh, most, most cases it is bioprosthesis, but it's not the way we, we advise to think. And then uh, there was a lot of discussion. And you know, a, a document is a joint document between uh, cardiologists and cardiac surgeons. And so there are two aspects, two solutions. Either we don't want to go together, either we want to go together. And in life, uh, if you want to go together, you should uh, come to an agreement, a reasonable agreement, because uh, we put in a central figure, all our decisions should be patient-centered, should not be self-defensive for self-defensive for uh, surgery, no. It is patient-centered. And uh, in uh, the US, there are tables of life expectancy of age for the global population. But at GSC, we are not willing to propose guidelines for, uh, for France only. We are willing to propose guidelines for the world. And Absolutely. here, uh, you have to adapt. You, you really have to adapt. Uh, for example, we have a durability a durability of THV, we know by randomized study, let's say five, eight years. And we have a longer term uh, observational study, but in randomized study, it's five, eight years. Uh, 75, you know, uh, in, um, in France, for example, 75, you have five years in front of you, especially if you are a woman, you have more than that. Uh, so it's pretty conservative, yes, but it's pretty reasonable. And uh, if you put it into the context, if you also accept that the patient choice plays a role, and if you have a uh, heart team who's not like that, semi-blinded, uh, it will work. Because the heart team will take all the factors into consideration, will take his own results, is also in a central figure, his own result with the both the procedure, and listen to the patient. And I think we'll be we'll be able to, to live with it. Okay. That's that's I absolutely agree with you on that. Um, thank you so much. And this kind of covers what you were saying. I'm just showing some uh, slides from your uh, document. But you know, to move on to another very important valve, which is the mitral valve. Um, ah. Where do the guidelines find the role for transcatheter repair following the two large trials that are really very determinant? the COAP trial and the MITRA-FR, albeit that they had inconsistent results. 
So based on these two trials with inconsistent results, where do the current guidelines stand? Okay, so this table is uh, the one for primary, yeah? Correct. You primary. have another <laughs> table for secondary, sorry, yeah? Because I know them by heart, you know? Yes, <laughs> <laughs> and this is the secondary one. Yeah, no, that is, that is a, so uh, we read or we did uh, these trials, and uh, I would say that they have diverging results, but somewhere they are complementary. Okay, uh, to me, COACT uh, point out a limited population, a small population, where transcatheter edge to edge repair was effective. In Mitra FR, we tried to, we looked at a very large population, all commerce, and here we did, we did not succeed. We also had different approaches because in Mitra FR, we rely on the heart team without very strong incentive about the medical search. And we probably perform the, the procedure in patients who are not under full treatment while it was extremely well scrutinized in COAP, where heart failure patients, there was selection coming. And also, finally, I think we were probably wrong uh, in the fact that we did not pay enough attention to the right ventricle. We did not exclude the patient with RV dysfunction or patient with a, a, a CVTR. We included them. And now it seems really that uh, it plays an important role. And finally, we relied on the guideline we wrote. So, uh, as regards the degree of MR. And now the both sets of guidelines in US and in, uh, Europe are perfectly aligned uh, and also they aligned uh, the degree of severity or the definition of severity, sorry, in primary MR and in secondary MR. And uh, the, you know, the threshold of growth is the same, which is uh, quite important. And I think uh, to have an efficacy of intervention, the threshold probably should be that of COA. So COA, small population, but very well defined, good results. Mitra FR, all commerce, and the results are, are not that good. Of course, we have to wait. Huh? We have to wait for, for follow. So what we try to propose in a, a guide, a document is we stress the fact that the medical therapy should be given, optimized uh, before any sort of treatment. And yesterday we had a good discussion at ESC. Uh, heart failure specialist was there. They fully agreed to be part, but we told them, we listen to you. But if you see the patient first, don't keep the patient during two years before sending the patient for intervention. So, do a full attempt, that's correct, but then follow carefully the patient, if it fails, should undergo intervention. Then you have several categories. If the patient must undergo surgery for aortic stenosis at the same time, CABG or tricuspid because you have a very severe TR, you should go for surgery. If the patient has only the mitral valve to focus on, we said, well, are you fulfilling the criteria suggesting a successful transcatheter edge to edge? If it is yes, we upgraded the indication. And uh, now uh, transcatheter should be considered. Before it was maybe considered. Now, sec to coap, it should be considered. And we put the coap criterion. Uh, we adapted the slightly. And at the difference uh, with the US guideline, we included a criterion on the LV, but also criterion on the RV. That's very important. Huh? Criterion on the RV should be in. On the opposite, if the patient does not fulfill the criterion, the heart team should decide. And there are several registries and uh, some experience suggesting that really the transcatheter might help selected patients 
for maybe a limited duration, but might help. So it should be really uh, in, in, uh, in the balance when we decide, but the heart team should also decide if it's not time to propose a patient for transplant, if it's not time to propose a patient for assist, it should be a global decision. And also something which is uh, touched throughout the guidelines is we have to decide according to the local possibility. If you are in a country where you cannot afford this transcatheter therapy, well, consider surgery twice. Or, and this is also, I'm sorry to come back, it's also valid for TAVI. In country where TAVI is not used or very seldom used, it's not a reason not to do surgery. You, you, you take my point, huh? Yes, yes, so absolutely. That, that, no, that, that is uh, the way we address, uh, we try to put together, but we, we are absolutely convinced that we still do not know exactly who are the responders to transcatheter edge to edge. And a plan we had with, uh, with Greg uh, Stone and others was to merge the database from MitraFR and uh, COAP, but uh, it's not done, let's say. Well, this is very, very crucial information that you gave us, you know, to look at the RV and, and pulmonary pressures, of course, um, and yes. see for the patients that are responders. But something you addressed, um, you know, center and operator volume, how yes. does that impact decisions to go ahead? And, and um, you know, on one end, you want centers and operators to build their experience. But at the same time, when you're making individual patient decisions, uh, management decisions, um, how do the guidelines address volume and experience? Hmm. So uh, I guess you, you read the guidelines, you had overnight to do that. Huh? Uh, no, but what, what I mean, it's a general philosophy. Uh, if you uh, treat the patient in a small center without surgery on site, you are not used to deal with valve patients. It means that you cannot select them appropriately in many countries, many countries. In some countries, for example, in Germany, uh, even centers without cardiac surgery are often able to treat a lot of patients. But let's uh, speak about what we know. In the US, it's even worse for this than in France. There are many small centers. But if you do not have cardiac surgery, usually you don't have a big volume of our disease. And for TAVI, for example, it was shown that the centers who have a large volume of surgery on the aortic valve do uh, uh, perform better in terms of TAVI than the one who don't have. And I think this also apply to mitral procedure and will probably apply to tricuspid procedure because the diagnostic part is essential. And who is making the diagnostic part? It is the clinical cardiologist, it is the echocardiographist, of course, it is the interventionist, and it is a cardiac surgeon. If these people are used to see these valve patients, they will do a good job. So what do we have about volume? The thresholds are, uh, you know, there are very few thresholds, and uh, some volumes are published in the US, but it's difficult to apply, uh, strictly apply uh, the finding is US to Europe. Some thresholds were proposed in Germany. In other countries, it varies. But also, uh, what is more important to me is that volume, it is the results in the given center. That's why we encourage the center to report and record their outcomes. Because you might do only 100 TAV, let's say, a year, or 200 TAV a year and have far better results than a center who do much more. You know, it's rare, but it might happen. It might happen. So let's say outcome should uh, be the, the first thing. So we cannot deny the importance of numbers, but outcomes are more important. Okay. I, uh, I think um, we need to move to the valve that we used to say is forgotten, the tricuspid valve, because you kind of touched on it as well. You know, when we yeah. look at the right-sided chambers, pulmonary hypertension, et cetera. And unfortunately, yeah. even more than the, the mitral valve, the tricuspid valve is often, very often referred very late. 
Um, yeah. and so what do the new guidelines compared to the 2017 guidelines recommend uh, with respect to intervening on the tricuspid valve for regurgitation? Well, uh, I think we um, uh, reinforce the fact that, well, in a very small sub, in a small subgroup, that the primary MR uh, were, uh, who claim to be asymptomatic, uh, if the uh, TR, sorry, who claim to be asymptomatic, we really propose to intervene very early. But it's a very small subgroup. But the big issue is the patient with secondary. And secondary MR in our practice and everywhere, I think, is very often neglected. It's neglected in patients who undergo surgery on the left side of the heart. And uh, when you operate, when you treat a mitral valve, you should always look at the tricuspid. If you do that, you are going to avoid catastrophe long term. That, that's, that's the problem. So this was already there in the previous guideline. It is re-emphasized that we should do the job uh, with the mitral early on. And if unfortunately you see the patient after a couple of months, a couple of years, don't wait too much to intervene on the tricuspid. Don't wait to have an RV which is dead. Don't wait to have a 200 uh, millimeter of mercury in the pulmonary pressure. Um, stupid, but with no RV, you don't have 200. But I mean, you understand what I mean? Very high resistance, etc. So that's extremely important. But what we added this year is two, uh, two statements. We also asked the colleagues to, be, to intervene more and earlier in patients who have severe secondary TR without previous intervention, because there are many patients. And we know now from studies that this patient had a very poor prognosis. So we should treat them earlier. That's very important. The second consequence is that now we have data, not a lot of data, not a lot, but promising data, which are building, building, on the transcatheter treatment of tricuspid valve disease. So that the uh, first time, and in the US guideline it was not done, we introduced this new technique. You know, uh, sake to my age, I saw the introduction of the TAVI, introduction of Mitraclip, etc. Now we start very slowly. We put a 2B, we are very cautious. You say, if you have a patient with severe TR, was not at the very end of the spectrum with acid uh, uh, three liters, uh, very high pulmonary hypertension, etc. If it is uh, severe but not too advanced, you should consider, if he's inoperable for any, any reason, you should consider referring this patient to a center with expertise in valve disease, of course, and with some expertise in the tricuspid uh, percutaneous treatment in order to do the appropriate patient selection. And here it is, of course, clinical, but it's also by imaging and uh, then uh, uh, imaging to, to tell you about the anatomy, to tell you about the feasibility and people who have done cases. But we wrote that it is mandatory to accumulate experience and to accumulate data. Fortunately, uh, randomized trials are uh, planned or ongoing in this domain, and we are going to take lessons. But if I may say, you know, I'm convinced that interventional tricuspid is great, but most important thing today is intervene early. Yes. The, you know? And I think one of the problems with surgical interventions in the tricuspid was durability. A lot of them um, you know, the repairs weren't durable either. Um, and so we're hoping that transcatheter durability will pan out eventually when we start to learn more about the different technologies. Yeah, but, yeah, but may I disagree with you? Of course. May I no, no I, I, I slightly disagree with you because if the repair, if we are dealing with secondary, you know, yeah. if the repair is done appropriately, uh, using annuloplasty, it's uh, usually, if it's done early appropriately, 
it's usually durable. What happens is uh, often, or not often, but time to time, repairs are done too late. Yeah. With a huge annually, with tethering, and it's too late. You should do valve replacement at this stage if you want to do something, but you are between two issues. Because if you have a huge annulus, it means that you have a huge right ventricle, it means that nothing will work. But uh, I think appropriate repair at a good time, usually uh, recurrence is not that frequent. And I would like to emphasize, if you can put it somewhere in your paper, it has been shown that surgery of the tricuspid is completely underused. At least in France, we showed that in the US, it was shown also, it's performed too late, which leads to catastrophe and underused. While adding a tricuspid repair, when you operate a patient for the mitral repair, almost doesn't add to the operative doesn't add. It just at the end, you know, they do, before closing the door, they, they do the repair. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, before we wrap up, there are just a few um, other issues in the valve guidelines that we perhaps can very quickly each one uh, touch on. So any updates with regards to pregnancy and valve disease? No, because there was an update, uh, a recent update by ESC on the pregnancy valve. No, there is no absolutely update. nothing new here. Um, prosthetic valves. Not really. We didn't change the age. We didn't change the thing. What we uh, what is changing, uh, but it, it's in the movement, is uh, antitrobotic treatment. Uh, yeah. We introduce. Uh, well, we, we we recognize the guidelines that for TIV, for example, uh, SAP single antiplatelet therapy is a way to go. Dual, forget it. We also said what you should not give oral anticoagulants, whatever it is, in a patient who doesn't need it and has a TAV, that's not, the, that's not the way to go. We also said that you should give oral anticoagulation in patients who have a TAV or surgical bioprosthesis where you see second uh, cusp limited movement and high gradient for during a, a couple of um, weeks, etc., or maybe longer. And as regards bioprosthesis, we also made a couple of proposals. But the issue is what about NOAC in patients uh, who need to have oral anticoagulation and who receive TAV? Here, I must say that we were a bit silent because when we wrote the guideline, we had only a negative trial, which was Galileo. Galileo. And, now, and now we still remain silent because the guidelines were published yesterday. And we know about the result of Atlantis, which did not show superiority, but they are still not published. So we're waiting for them. And we heard yesterday the result of Envisage, which uh, let's say are not positive. We can say that this way. Uh, so is it due to the fact that one, NOAC is not like the other? Is it due to dosing? That's most uh, possible. Is it due also to the fact that the TAVI patients are extremely difficult patients, high thrombotic risk, but very high bleeding risk? So I think the, uh, we should work more. And while waiting for the data, uh, the physician will do their best. But I must say that from what I know, uh, asking the colleagues all over the world, it seems that, uh, because we are, we, are, we are stupid in this data. We told the colleagues, you have a patient with autistic stenosis, now NOAC are recommended over VKA if they are in AFib. And okay, okay, grade one. But then the patient undergo TAVI and you do not give us a recipe. I think, uh, well, there are several arguments pleading to stay with NOC, but we have no proof, really. Absolutely, yeah. I think the three trials that you mentioned, um, Galileo being the first, not only were yeah. the bleeding events higher, but thrombotic events were also higher, and so it was terminated uh -huh. early. And so we don't yeah. know enough about NOACs in TAVI in those who don't have an indication for oral anticoagulation. No, no, no. No, this one, uh, I think we should not give it. We put a great three. But the one we need, 
uh, I think also we should be cautious, you know, uh, not to say uh, there is one you know, who is better than the other. Correct. Because uh, there are dosage problem and uh, we have to be cautious. And uh, what would be good is if the groups, the group in uh, Paris and the group uh, in New York and the others merge data in order to have very large database and to tell uh, us, uh, well. Absolutely, I think um, having higher volume uh, cohorts uh, actually helps us with the data. So yeah. finally, as we wrap up over here, um, is there anything else about the current 2021 guidelines that you wish to let us know about uh, that we haven't discussed this afternoon? No, I think we discussed a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I think. <laughs> Thank you so no, much for your time. No, no. But you have the you have the document. Uh, read it, and if you pinpoint a mistake, please send me a mail. Will do. Thank you. No, that will be good. Thank you for your your kind invitation. Bye bye. Thank you, PCR Online, and we'll see you again next time.